record on this computer. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to the latest uh, virtual monthly EFF Austin meetup. Uh, my name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. See a bunch of old faces and also a few new faces. Welcome uh, to both new and old. Um, for those of you who are new, um, so you may be like, uh, what is EFF Austin? Though I imagine you'd have some idea if you stumbled upon this. But EFF Austin is a longstanding Austin-based uh, digital civil liberties organization. We're actually going on our 30th anniversary here in the upcoming year. Maybe uh, COVID will be done in time for us to actually celebrate it in some fashion. But um, we were um, founded alongside the events that led to the founding of Electronic Frontier Foundation, our big famous sister organization based out of San Francisco. They are the nation's foremost digital civil liberties advocacy group. They're basically the ACLU for the internet and emerging technologies, but they help protect your rights in emerging technological spaces. They fight for things like net neutrality, end-to-end -end encryption, ending warrantless digital surveillance, protecting section 230 of the CDA, and all sorts of really great stuff to help safeguard your rights. So um, they're a really great organization. You should check them out if you want to get more involved in the cause. Um, give them money if it's in your budget. You can give us money too if it's in your budget, but you should always prioritize giving them money. Um, so this is basically the beginning of our monthly meetup where I usually go over some basic business and announcements um, just to let people know what we're up to, what we have coming up as well as uh, give the community a chance to share anything that may be relevant. So the big thing to announce that we have going on right now is that tomorrow evening, we are having our annual holiday party. It is a virtual edition this year, as you might imagine. It's also, as it often is the case, it's doubling as a fundraiser for us as well. So it's a suggested um, $20 donation, though that is just suggested. You may donate less or more as your budget allows, but suggest a $20 donation. Um, and the funds will be going equally to us and EFF. So 50% of the funds we're raising are going to EFF, 50% to support our ongoing expenses. But I'm going to post the link to the event in the chat here, which will also have details about how you can buy your ticket and get the Zoom link and passcode to attend. But I, um, I encourage all of you who are in our community and interested in these issues to attend. It should be a great time to hang out virtually with like-minded digital civil liberties geeks. Um, we also have a few, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, to answer George's question, yes, our board member Ritika is going to be DJing the party. So the, uh, that to look forward to. We will have musical entertainment. Um, and we're also going to have some pretty cool speakers. We're going to have uh, one of the organizers from EFF. Rory's going to be there. I'm going to give a brief little talk. And our big cool keynote speaker is uh, Brenda Laurel, who is kind of a legend in um, just kind of the, you know, one of the pioneers of the internet and video games and cool stuff. Um, she, she spoke at TED back in the late 90s. Um, there you can go find the talk if you want to see her in action. But she's been groundbreaking both in the space of she wrote some of the earliest uh, virtual reality applications. She's been at the forefront of pushing for more inclusive representation in the video game industry of making sure that video games are for girls and women and not just boys and men. And um, just in general, really a brilliant thinker. She also wrote a groundbreaking book of, on cyber studies called uh, Cyberspace as Theater back in the early 90s. So uh, very cool guest with a very long, illustrious career that we feel uh, very fortunate that she will be joining us and speaking with us. So I highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, we usually save our really amazing uh, speakers for our big events like this and uh, very happy we got Brent and uh, I, uh, I thought about inviting uh, Corey Doctorow again, but I'm like, but we've had him so many times and, and there's other cool people. So, you know, Corey's going to be doing a talk at the meetup sometime next year. I'm in early talks with him, but we decided to do somebody new for the party. So that's the big thing we have coming up. Um, also, we're continuing um, our now several meetings in, but we're continuing our new ongoing series of a book club um that david is running um we've basically been going through um 
a book that's basically on surveillance policing, basically, and the way that surveillance tech has changed law enforcement and policing and how it's conducted. Um, so we've been um, so we've been uh, doing that. We're in like the fourth or fifth one on that. Um, we've been doing them every other Thursday at 7 p.m. We had one last Thursday. David, are we having one on the third Thursday this month, or do you think that's too close to the holidays? Um, no, we're still planned for the uh, for the 17th. Okay, so they're the first and third Thursdays of the month at 7 p.m. Um, the next one will be the third Thursday of this month, the 17th at uh, 7 p.m. And um, reading the book is not required to participate. Um, I've been too busy to read the book, but David is uh, reading the books and he's running the meetings. So there will always be at least one person there who's read it to keep things on task. But if it's just a topic you're interested in, you want to come chat about it and chat with people who may or may not have read the book about the topic, we're not requiring that you have read the book for our book club. So what's that's the book on the 17th? Uh, David, I'm blanking on the title. What is the title again? It is the rise of big data policing, surveillance, race, and the future of law enforcement. Yep, um, and we're at I think chapters five and six at this point on that one. Um, so we'll probably we're getting toward the end of that book. We'll we'll be doing it for this one and maybe one more. I don't know what the next book will be yet. Um, but yeah. Um, it's a cool series David's been uh, running for us, and I'm very excited that we're able to offer it as more uh, COVID times programming. So um, that's an ongoing thing. We also are going to continue to have our monthly meetups into the coming year. They will be, for the time being, I'm still planning to have them be the second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. I actually just remembered I need to get back to Capital Factory and let them know that I want to keep our normal time. So it'll be on their calendar, but, um, and barring some change, it's going to be the same time they've been at. I'm actively um, currently booking speakers to the new year. The uh, only month I currently have booked so far is February, where our former board member, Kathy Mitchell, is going to come talk to us about some of the uh, EFF Austin relevant bills that may be before the Texas legislature at the time and give us her uh, lobbying legislative expertise about um, well, that's good and bad in those bills and what we should do about it. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Kathy is also just an amazing um, activist in the community. She was actually recently profiled by the Austin Chronicle as one of 20 amazing Austinites this year. She's been one of the primary leaders in the uh, police reform movement that's been going on in Austin this year. So uh, I really highly recommend coming and checking out her talk. Um, if you're cool and want to give a talk or know somebody who's cool and want to give a talk, please get at me because I still need to book the other months. And as you may have noticed, I have February booked, but I don't for sure have January booked can, yet. I have three or four people who have expressed tentative interest, but it is still technically up for grabs. So let me know if you're interested. Um, any other things we have coming up I need to announce? Mm -hmm. Let me think. Um, Normally, we would probably be doing something for South by Southwest. Obviously, this is a very weird year. I don't know if we will be doing anything yet, but stay tuned. We may end up doing some small virtual thing then, but it remains to be seen. Um, yeah, and I guess, oh, I'll just, uh, you know, I'll continue to shout out that we continue to have an ongoing campaign of trying to work on getting um, Austin City Council to consider putting uh, limits on the use of facial recognition technology by Austin law enforcement personnel. We are continuing to seek signatures for our petition there. It's been a little bit on the back burner for me these last few months um, because I've just been so busy with so many other things, but we are still working on that and I encourage you to sign and share with your friends. If that is important to you, I will drop a link to that in the comments in a second. Um, so I think that's just about everything. So before I uh, introduce our speaker, does uh, anybody uh, from the community want to make any announcements? Shameless self-promotion is totally okay and allowed as long as you think it would be of interest to the AFF Austin community. So does anybody have anything they want to share? Nope. Cool. All right. I, without further ado, before I ramble all night, I am going to introduce our speaker. So we're very lucky to have back with us Dr. Uh, Sharon Strover. Um, Sharon Strover has previously, a few years ago, been at one of our meetups. She was actually on a panel we had um, that a very, um, I'm trying to remember, 
Sure. Do you know what what was the topic of our panel? Uh, it so was, many panels. I know. So many topics. Yeah, because it was oh, it was a really good one. I'm trying to remember because it was. Uh, I'd have to go back and check. But Sharon's been on a panel we did a few years ago. I'm blanking. Oh, I'm. I think it was on digital literacy and how we develop digital literacy skills. That's right. That would be logical. That would be logical. Yes. So, um, so Sharon was on that panel. Um, we've also um, just crossed paths, EFF Austin and Sharon, and a few events over the years. Most recently, Sharon and I were actually both on a panel, sort of adjacent to tonight's topic on online disinformation that we both uh, spoke at uh, one of the Austin Public Library branches on the topic. Weirdly enough, it was one of the last things I did before the COVID time. So, uh, um, but at the time, I was uh, very interested by a lot of what Dr. Strober has been researching about online disinformation campaigns. And so I figured I wanted to have her back and share her latest research with us. But, um, but yeah, just um, to give you all a quick bio summary, she, uh, she is the Philip G. Warner Regents Professor in Communications and former chair of the Radio Television Film Department at UT Austin. She teaches communications and technology courses. She also directs the Technology and Information Policy Institute there. She, all, she researches a whole bunch of cool stuff, including uh, local and statewide networks and broadband service, the relationship between economic outcomes and the internet, misinformation, the digital divide, and rural broadband deployment. Uh, yeah, I mean, her resume is a very impressive uh, group of organizations. She's worked with the European Union, um, the Ford Foundation, the Rural Policy Institute, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we're basically, you know, honored that Sharon uh, deigns to spend a bit of her time with us because we are so interested in this stuff and happy to get her expertise on all of it. So I think without me rambling too much further on, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Schroeder and uh, see what her latest research has uncovered about the state of online disinformation. Well, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. I was thinking back to that talk we gave at, at a local library, and I was expecting about five people to show up, and it was actually standing room only. Uh, I think you were the draw <laughs> on that. But it, I, I, I certainly do not know if I was the draw, especially considering that most of the people there were like, I don't know, like seem, they seem like older homeowners that I'd literally yeah. never met before. So They were, which, which I found fascinating. I did too, because it was not your normal like 20-something hacker type who would normally be interested in this stuff. Exactly. exactly. And that says something about libraries. But I think it also says something about how pervasive this subject is, this, this disinformation. And increasingly, we're hearing about misinformation as well, especially mm -hmm. around COVID. So, uh, and there's been a huge amount of general purpose newspaper coverage, which we often don't see. For, for topics that like this, and, I would and, say topics. Right, and you know, just before, well, one last thing I'll just say about the event that struck me that I was also mm -hmm. impressed with that, you know, despite it not being a quote unquote young hacker, you tech savvy audience, I was actually incredibly impressed with the inside of the audience, a lot of the questions they asked, these were people who were informed on this issue. They were not like complete, these were not people getting tricked by like, you know, disinformation masquerading as a meme page, you know, it's, it, they went against the stereotype of people falling for this stuff. They were very informed. I th they were thoughtful and they were trying to be informed, uh, yet they did not know what a meme was. That's true, actually. Which, which actually has led to a research proposal for me, which maybe I'll get into towards the end end of, uh, of, of this little talk. So I uh, thank you for the introduction, Kevin, and I'm happy to talk, talk a little bit about what I know or what our research has, has focused on in the disinformation space. It, it turns out this topic area has really galvanized a lot of the research community coming from many different disciplines, actually, as, as well. Um, and but by way of background, our, we have a research institute that uh, looks at a lot of different topics. The kind of core element to it is technology, it, but technology as it affects social life, as it affects 
politics, as it affects economics. And so consequently, that laundry list of topics, which really made me feel old, actually, <laughs> are, are, the, are topics that I've addressed over, over many years, actually, and some of the currency of them ebbs and flows. Right now, the work I've been doing for, gosh, more than 10 years on broadband, for example, which used to really be relegated to the weeds, suddenly became really current with COVID because everybody suddenly realized, hey, not everybody has broadband access, not everybody can afford these uh, subscription plans, what can we do about it? So it's, there's been just a surge of interest in all things broadband and all things digital inclusion. This is our, our current homepage and just some of the topic areas on which our kind of current portfolio is, is focusing. And actually this little area on related to good systems is the domain that more or less invited us into the disinformation topic area. We also have another center in my college, the Moody College of Communication, that is squarely focused on propaganda. So um, I can maybe hook some of those folks up with EFF uh, as, it's, as it's appropriate too. But Good Systems is a research challenge in, in the university parlance. And um, it's fundamentally interested in the ethics of artificial intelligence. And as everything began to roll out a couple of years ago about the ways in which the Russians in particular were playing the dynamics of our social media platforms, it became a really obvious topic area for us to take a look at so that we could advise, understand, hopefully contribute to the building of better systems in the future that can counter dis and misinformation. And, and in fact, for the last year or so, we've had monthly talks sharing our research on disinformation. And we just included a couple of, of talks on misinformation around COVID. The next one and the one for the which will wrap up our year is on this week Thursday, actually this Thursday at noon. So let me know if you're interested in COVID misinformation and there will be some cutting edge research that we can share on that. Uh, actually, it's gra some graduate student teams that did research over the summer. In any case, um, um, I, I asked Kevin to what extent I really needed to go over some of these ideas with the EFF constituency. He said, mm, there's some pretty sophisticated people in this, in this constituency. So uh, I suspect I don't really need to define the differences between fake news and misinformation and disinformation as well. We're all pretty familiar with things that are just when you see them right off the bat, absolutely not true, often concocted. Um, and in as much as there's been so much discussion about misinformation recently in the COVID space, um, I, I feel it is incumbent on us to, to underscore that misinformation is even more plentiful than disinformation. Disinformation being defined as politically motivated, poor information or incorrect information. Misinformation is just some crazy, sometimes it's just some crazy stuff. Sometimes it's fear mongering, conspiratorial with, with or with, it usually without a true political motivation. It's almost um, difficult to, to pick up the paper or, or certainly engage online spaces these days without constantly wondering if what one is looking at is misinformation. And I was so, I've been so struck by some of the damage that misinformation is, is doing. And this is an image of a local grocery in Houston that apparently a competitor planted a coronavirus rumor that cleared out everybody, everybody who was shopping there. And it really hurt this particular supermarket. But disinformation is the politically motivated flavor of online and often offline information that we've been looking at fairly carefully. 
And there's, a, as I said before, a large cadre of, of folks, many of them academics, many of them not, many advocacy organizations are also really carefully scrutinizing the message space, spaces on all social media. Our focus specifically looked at Twitter and Facebook, but there are endless and increasingly both interesting and frightening flavors of disinformation. Deep fakes have come to be increasingly prominent and the deep fake that was circulated in 2018 around the high school student, Emma, uh, well that slide didn't make it in here. I had a photo of Emma Gonzalez who was a um, high school student from one of the high schools, Stoneman High School that had a shooter and she became one of the activists and as some of you may know, she was, uh, she made a public talk with some of her uh, fellow activists and ripped up a bullseye from a typical target practice effort. And somebody photoshopped in an image of the Constitution. So she was photoshopped ripping up the Constitution and that went viral. Incredibly damaging to her, incredibly damaging to her cause as well, even though it was quickly exposed as dis or miss information. And then of course, um, there's been increasing sophistication around memes and what one can do with memes in terms of spreading disinformation and even misinformation as well. And memes have some unique characteristics that distinguish them, of course, from what one sees on Twitter and Facebook that has sort of, that kind of backs into some of the research that we're engaged in as well. So what we were especially interested in was not so much actually spotting disinformation. And in fact, I've, I've kind of stayed away from that because I think there's a lot of people doing that right now. And we're really fortunate in having people who are kind of scouring the internet and looking for disinformation, including people who are in the government, but also a lot of people who are not part of the government. And we increasingly are able to see that when you see something that has maybe a foreign source behind it and it seems a little bit crazy, uh, that sends up some warning flags. And the organization of fact-checking efforts has, has been mammoth. Actually, there are teams working in many, many countries that are working on detecting bots and fakes and false sources and circulating those as, as fast as they can. And in many cases, they're working with the platform companies in order to identify them. Platforms and what they can do or are doing is another matter. Maybe we can take up towards the end of, of my remarks. Um, we're interested, especially in what happens when people do see these messages, how they respond to them, and why in particular they share this information. And there are some pretty well-known psychological factors. And the fancy term for, for one of the most popular psychological factor that many of us use to explain why people click on this misinformation or disinformation and send it to all their friends has to do with confirmation bias, which is simply the idea that if something kind of suggests something you already believe, you will circulate it quickly and without really thinking about it very carefully. Confirmation bias also goes along with some of the ways that we as humans process information. And there are characteristics in social media platforms that jibe a little too well with ways of processing information that are not especially rational, that are very quick, and that respond to emotion in particular. And then another psychological factor is, is very simply our tendency as human beings to believe what we see, to believe what is in front of our gaze without taking the time to think about the clues and about the markers and, and taking the time to question whether or not what we're seeing is in fact real or believable. 
And then finally, some research is also beginning to focus on how we can cultivate more responsible information sharing behaviors. If you, if you think about this as, well, the way we think about it as, as a problem space is that messages and where they come from is one big domain. Platforms and what they do, what they do perhaps too well is another kind of domain. And then what, how people respond is still another domain. And, and then that can very logically lead into how we evaluate perhaps governmental efforts or other training efforts that can have some bearing on how people can share responsibly. By the way, I can't see anybody on my screen, so um, I am fine if you want to chime in at any point. I'm really used to that. So feel free to do that if you, if you want to contribute something or if you have a question or something like that. We, we have a few people who've been plopping in some questions in the chat. Oh, um, oh really? Well, if they're appropriate at this moment, feel free. I, I apologize. I can't see the chat. Uh, a few of them strike me as uh, relevant right now. So like one question we had was uh, um, it prefaced with stupid question. How would you define the difference between fake news and disinformation? Is it just the political intent? Yes, that's the typical differentiation. Yeah. It's the political intent. Mm -hmm. and, th and then I have a uh, somewhat meta question of what about anti-D misinfo? Are these based in misinfo or disinfo? <laughs> I don't know what that means. You mean? Uh, I'm not, mean? A, I'm, I'm just repeating the question <laughs> verbatim. Uh, whoever asked it is welcome uh, to uh, rephrase right uh, now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. First of all, I am so happy to be here that I am just giddy. Um, Anti-DEI <laughs> was my quick word for anti-diversity, equity, and inclusion. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't want to say just race-based because it could be mm -hmm. gender or orientation or anything else. So yeah. for those forces that aren't interested in DEI, um, when they probably I think that's a really... That yeah, I think that's a really great question, actually. Great. And Thank you for to, asking to, it. Yeah, to a certain extent, it raises questions about the extent to which our perceptions and the way we interact with information is kind of based it, baked into um, social responses that are racist and the ways in which some of our systems, some of our, the way, not only the way we read, but what is presented to us in various sources is either uh, inadvertently racist or deliberately racist. I know there, there's a lot of discussions right now in, on, on, in the circles I'm, I'm kind of involved with about what's going on with Google and their firing of one of their lead researchers who was trying to get them to take racism more seriously. Um, and it's very, very distressing. Is that misinformation? I, no, I, I think it's in a somewhat different category, but some of the same psychological factors may be at work in, in terms of how people look at the information circulating around those sorts of issues. So um, maybe that's something we could come back to a little bit later too. Well, you know, and I, I guess I'll just say on that one, I, I still need to do more research about the specifics around that firing, but the particular circumstances to me really, it, it looks like an example of an inconvenient truth that her research was basically uncovering that massive language model data sets of the kind that are key to Google's ad business may be structurally racist in certain ways in and of themselves. And yes. Google really didn't want to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and among the folks looking at machine language and, and uh, training sets, of course, that is absolutely germane. The, those illustrations are absolutely, you know, seminal to, think, to thinking about this particular issue. Thank you very um, much. I'm going to stay silent. I look forward to hearing to the rest of your talk. Okay, okay. Um, well, 
a lot of a lot of people have looked at the at some of the same terrain that that we've done research on and one of the earliest reports looking at specifically the tactics that we became aware of being at work in the 2016 election space which is actually from like 2015 on into 2017 came from a, a local group <laughs> new knowledge who uh, made the made an observation that was echoed in the Mueller report too that that there's a sweeping and sustained social influence operation that was at work with you know wielding various disinformation tactics and if you speak to some of the Russian experts on campus uh, you, they would immediately put this particular influence operation in a much broader context which has been ongoing for a long time with very the very same tactics that have been shown to work in different uh, geographies and in different media over time. So this is a kind of a well-rehearsed playbook on the part of the Russian disinformation efforts. Of course, now in the more contemporary circumstance, we know that other countries are engaging in similar tactics as well. What we tried to do uh, specifically when we started this project was to look at the Russian um, campaigns specifically and try to figure out a little bit more about what that campaign was, what the messages were, and how they thought the message, messages might have some impact on us. Of course, it's really difficult to ascertain impact. You need a certain kind of study to really know if a message has a particular influence and we don't have you know a few years down the road we can't do that kind of research obviously we do know that the russian internet research agency operated its troll farm this is not a directly a government operation it's actually run by a friend however of putin so it's an arm's length government government effort um, and during the 2016 election, interestingly enough, they, they placed only about 3,500 Facebook sponsored ads. That doesn't seem like that much to me. And I was kind of surprised to find that it was only about 3,500 Facebook ads. It was several more Twitter uh, tweets, I should say, um, than that. And the critical dimension of course, to trying to do this in a social media space is not just those initial placements anyway, it's where they go afterwards. So um, basically the Mueller report ascertained that there were over 30 million Facebook ads that, that were linked to Russia that ended up being shared to a variety of users. And you can do some, if you have access to the data, you can actually do network analyses to figure out what the networks were that circulated and recirculated some of those images. Um, that data, of course, Facebook holds. And Facebook did make it available to a couple of researchers. But after the, uh, the some of the scandals that Facebook went through, they became much more cautious about sharing data for good or for ill. It is interesting that so many people were fooled by these fakes, by the tweets and by the Facebook ads, even top newspapers, the places that we might turn to thinking, well, these are fast fact checked and they're authoritative and so forth. Even those reporters, you know, were, were duped in certain ways and if you what what did surprise me when i actually looked at those 3500 facebook ads is uh, is what i'm going to share with you and and um maybe i don't know if how many of you have looked at these ads as well they were surprising in that most of them didn't really mention the specific political campaigns there were a few ads that mentioned Trump and Clinton and trashed one or the other of them, but a lot more of them were about issues of immigration, issues of what, what we might call nationalism, issues of police, 
um, and, and issues pertaining to racism. And we, in fact, did a did kind of a deep dive into many of the tweets and Facebook ads that apparently were targeting uh, the African American constituency. Face or the IRA cleverly concocted this fake organization, BM, to kind of play off of Black, Black Lives Matter, and that was a common sponsor for a lot of these ads, which if you didn't really think about it very much, would seem like, oh, well, it's Black Lives Matter, but in fact it wasn't. But this was a very typical sort of ad that, you know, it's sort of a feel-good, here's somebody who created a police reform foundation, very, very pretty conventional among the set of the set of ads. When Facebook did release the Facebook political ad data, those 3,500 ads, they released them as PDFs. So uh, with two, two images, basically, one image was the ad itself. The other image was this, it was metadata basically, and metadata is like gold to a researcher, because <laughs> this is, we can really work with this pretty easily. Um, and I show it to you just because it's, it's sort of interesting if you've never placed an ad with Facebook to know what they can, what they, what you are allowed to select for. And, you know, they include, of course, the text, the locations, which are pretty interesting, the kinds of people or certain fact factors about the people people to whom you want your ad targeted, placements, of course. What I loved about this is that it's paid in rubles. And Facebook was not clued into that <laughs> for a while, actually. It just wasn't on their radar that, gee, somebody's paying for political ads in rubles. So I thought that was interesting. Um, the, uh, the ads included issue ads and a handful of fake events. And in fact, we decided to do a careful look at one of the fake events that they promulgated and it was the event that occurred in Houston. It was one that was written about perhaps a little bit more than a few others, but we found about 40 or so occasions in which the uh, IRA tried to kind of gin up um, activity around some issue that they thought constituents would would have some emotional attachment to. And quite typically, they would place an ad saying, come out and protest about this, and then also at the same time, place a counter ad so that they could very deliberately, which, which they did in Houston, have a protest and a counter protest. And this, this is sort of emblematic of what we see in the ad content overall, which is what I'll get to shortly. But there were a lot of fake events that fooled people, that actually brought people out when they didn't know who the sponsors were. We learned, uh, and the Mueller report actually un un unfolded some of the, or un uh, revealed some of this as well, that their typical mode in that case was to find a local sponsor at the 11th hour and say, oh, I can't make it, can you take my place? So that somebody lo who had said, oh, I'm coming, I'm really into this, they would just turn to that and that would then become the local advert, the local sponsor at the last moment because the Russians weren't going to show up to it. So uh, in Houston, the issue uh, came from and the, the Islamic Center in Houston, which was uh, premiering its brand new library. And somehow the Russian IRA found out about this and concocted a lot of ads around Islamization of Texas. And this is a sample of one of their ads and they organized a protest basically. And you can see that then there were some counter ads that you know, said, hey, if you want to save Islamic knowledge, you should protest. And in fact, there was, a, there was a small group of protesters, the ones in the foreground of the images on the right hand of your page holding the Confederate flag, and then many more counter protesters who came out once they heard that the protesters were there. So the whole effect was division, fundamentally. It was get people riled up, get people angry 
at each other. The Islamic Center, by the way, and we've interviewed folks at the, at the Islamic Center, they wanted nothing to do with this in any way, shape, or form. They thought it could lead to violence. They were very unhappy that anything at all was happening. Um, we can come back to that <laughs> as well, if you like, at, at, towards the end of it. So what we've been looking at specifically it has a lot more to do with cognition in social media. And we were keenly interested in this quality of emotion that social media forms are so good at invoking and evoking as well. And we sought to, tr to look to see if there was anything systematic about the ways in which the, the sorts of tweets and the Facebook material that we know came from the Russian IRA. And, and having this known provenance was important to us. If there was any way that, that this was strategic on their part. So we try, so we arrayed the messages and have a metric for the, um, their emotional content that we decided to look at over time. And then we also wanted to look at the messages in terms of who were they targeting. When I showed you that metadata page, a minute ago. Some of them were clearly targeting African Americans. Some of them were clearly targeting progressives or people who Democrats, people who might be a little more on the left side of the political spectrum. And others were clearly targeting people who were a little bit more on the right side of the political spectrum, you know, populists, nationalists, and and, and so forth, to use terms I'm not that comfortable with, but they, they um, create the idea of what, who they were actually targeting. And then when we looked at the Houston um, event in particular, we were thinking about how we can apprehend impact at all. But in any case, let me share with you some of what, some of what our, our findings were. Um, this was the timeline of those IRA efforts, and as I said before, that big Cambridge Analytical scandal where it came out that they had shared their data, data that they weren't supposed to share from Facebook with other, other sources came up. And of course, from about this period of time on into 2017, the IRA was promulgating ads and was placing its tweets and its Instagram messages and, and so forth. Um, Congress began its investigation of the IRA in 2018. Many of you probably remember that Facebook hearing with, with uh, Zuckerberg in summer, well, April 2018. Uh, Congress released data from Facebook and then later from Twitter later on in 2018. Um, and then, well, yeah, in October of 2018. So as of late 18, 2018, we actually had some pretty good data sets to investigate this issue in a more systematic way. And I'm not, this is, this is a very wonky thing just to give you my bona fides, really. But we were really interested in how social media interacts with politics. We were very interested in emotion as I said before, and we're interested in features of the platform that, that can kind of interact with these other factors. So this is, this is the wonkiest slide that I, I think it's the wonkiest. I don't know, you can tell me later. I, I, I appreciate that level. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and actually, this is going back to something you said a minute ago, but we had one question in the chat. Somebody was wondering whether any of these uh, fake um, organizations and ads. Was there any things in that that tied into the Unite the Right rallies in Charlottesville? Did that fuel or amplify that yes. in any way? Oh, the Charlottesville. Um, there, there were, but I, there were, there were, but, but Charlottesville also had its own independent trajectory. I, and that was my feeling as well, that like it wasn't just an IRA no. uh, operation, obviously, but I think just the question was, yeah, what, did they amplify that, the IRA? I believe, I believe we saw that, but it was not, it didn't rise to the top in terms of volume, the way, say, the Houston uh, event did. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, 
so what we did initially was we took a look at all of those, the, you know, the, the easiest thing to do, which was the first thing we did, was we took a look at all of those IRA ads. And there is a, there's an analytic tool that can actually rate emotion in the text associated with these ads. And the, one of the first things we wanted to do is to see, well, what are these ads all like angry, angry ads? And uh, I have some examples, and, and this particular scale rates emotion on about 40 points, from negative 21 for really negative to positive 21, to pretty positive. And this actually was rated as most negative in terms of this particular um, scale, which is a scale several people have used. It doesn't mean there aren't others. There hopefully will be an even better one in the future. But this was rated as the most negative in terms of sentiment. And again, the measure has a lot to do with the text here. Um, trying to rate the images is much, much trickier, it turns out. But this was rated most negative. This was rated as most positive. And, you know, I was really surprised to see this ad in the, in the set of IRA ads. It's another one of those kind of feel goods, feel good ads. And there were a lot of feel good ads in the data set, which were speculating had certain kinds of intentions associated with them. So we have negative, this is positive. Then uh, there are ads like this, which I would have thought would be most highly rated negative. It was rated negative but not as negative as the one I showed you before. This is obviously one that does directly refer to the candidate in the election, you know, positioning Clinton as the devil and so forth. Um, but the image itself is very emotional. And it, when you look at it, there's a, a, you, can, you, get, you get it right away because of the power of the image itself compared to this, which you kind of have to read in order to understand a little bit more. So I thought that this was very interesting. We had a student trace some of the sources of these ads, and uh, he used the Wayback Machine actually to find that many of the images that were used by the IRA were in circulation. A lot of them uh, came out of Reddit in one way, shape, or form. In fact, many people now believe Reddit is kind of a testing ground for some of the ad content. But what we, when we looked overall, this is kind of wonky, I'll believe, I admit, but when we looked overall at those 3,500 ads or so, what we found was kind of surprising because most, the overall sentiment on Facebook was positive. The green is all kind of in the positive range of that scale. The red is, is negative. You can't see the line at zero. Zero meant neutral, of course. Um, and it was positive. So we tried to, you know, figure out, well, why that, that was kind of counterintuitive. We did not expect them to be positive. And this is one reason why we started to think about, well, were they positive throughout the campaign? And so we, we plotted the sentiment scores over time. And this is what we came up with. We found that, uh, in, in fact, when it comes to, again, this is just Facebook, um, that, that there was a, some positivity in those early months of the campaign. And then right before the election, they really took a dive. They got very, they got, well, more negative. I would say T tweets, by the way, were even more extreme as you'll see in, in a minute. But there was a dive right there. And then after the campaign, they became more positive again. So, how to interpret this is, is the question. So we know that positive ads get more clicks and impressions. If you want something to circulate virally, make it more positive. We surmise that that's one reason why early on there were more ads in, in the positive 
domain space to kind of get a, get a viral pattern going, maybe get people used to some of these sources so they could like them and invite them into their own groups, and then hit people with more negative ads closer to the election. So this is our kind of working hypothesis that the positive ads really kind of cultivated an in-group identity early on. Who would those in-groups be? Um, they could include older people, because older people are heavier Facebook users, even in 2016. Um, now, of course, in 2020, they use Facebook more than younger people do, by far. So, um, so that, this is one of our hypotheses. It may also be the case that in-group identity and cultivating it was important to establishing a niche with the black voting population as well. And we have some specific hypotheses around that, uh, that that I'll get into in a second, because what we were able to do was to use some of the research that people have, had done on Twitter to, to break out who was being targeted in both Facebook and in Twitter. And we call them trolls. So we looked at messages that we, and coded all of them if the, and encoded them according to whether they seem to be targeting people on the left, people on the right, and the black community. The black community, as it turns out, is more identified with the left than the right, but we broke them out as a separate constituency. And we did that for both tweets, the set of many, many, many tweets, and for Facebook. And we thought it'd be interesting to see if there are differences in the emotional appeals associated with those particular groups. And there's a lot of theory behind, uh, behind the ways in which social media cultivate group identities. And I'm sure many of you are well aware that Twitter is, is Twitter and Facebook and a lot of other sites are really good for giving you a kind of sense of group cohesion. The fancy terms are bonding, capital, uh, make you trust people in your group. And this is what we believe was, is in part at work on some of these platforms. So, uh, yeah, I had, I had changed this slide. I apologize um, that uh, it didn't, it didn't stay here, <laughs> but I'm, I'm inviting you to look only at the left panel here. The left panel is month is reduced to monthly sentiment scores. It's the same scoring system I showed you a while ago, emotion. And the right-hand panel, which looks really messy, is more granular. It's, it's really broken down into daily sentiment scores. So, but the left one is more interpretable. So just look at the left panel here. And on the upper part, we have Facebook. On the lower part, we have Twitter. And this was quite surprising to us. <laughs> you know, we, it would have been a lot more, um, we would have loved to, to have been able to say that the Russians used Facebook and Twitter exactly the same way. And they had a concerted messaging that, you know, it was somewhat positive at first and then dipped around the election and then went up so that people, everybody could feel good about the election. But that's not really exactly what we see. Um, so again, we have to explain what it is that we're seeing. We've already talked about this, these Facebook ads and the way there's a dip. It doesn't show up quite as much on this scale, but it's a dip right around the election. And then down here, here's Twitter. And Twitter, first of all, is always negative. It's always, almost always below zero. So it's always negative. It goes a lot more negative than Facebook goes in general. And you see after the election, it gets pretty positive. And then into 2017, it just takes a really deep dive down. Um, how can we actually explain that? I explain it in a couple of ways. I think that the Russians are smart enough to know there are somewhat different constituencies on these two platforms. Facebook always reaches more people and it's a more generalized audience as well. Twitter is smaller, it's younger, 
it's news hounds and it's news organizations as well. News organizations are heavy users of, of Twitter. So um, perhaps that explains why they decided to stay in the negative territory with Twitter to keep the kind of feeling of being on edge, of being, you know, the, the message of divisiveness to keep that current. Uh, that's one explanation at, at least. When we look, when we break out the left versus the right troll here, and I don't know how, if you can see this very well, and I had a somewhat different slide prepared that didn't make it into the deck, but there are some different emotional patterns associated with left versus right here. Again, these are monthly sentiment scores on Facebook. And again, we see appealing to the left, this, this dip around the election, and then it goes up. The right is, is a little more consistent that, you know, it doesn't vary as much. It stays more consistently positive. Um, and there's not as much change overall. When we look at Twitter, we see this huge divergence after the election. Again, it's, it all starts negative uh, for both left trolls and right tro trolls. But then the left gets positive and the right goes really negative. So why, if the right is the constituency that the Russian IRA really wants to appeal to and wants to wants to congratulate for perhaps electing President Trump, why have all these negative messages? And I have a really simple explanation. I don't really know if it's correct or not, but I think this just increasingly keeps people worked up. If the right is not even allowed to feel good about electing President Trump via these Twitter messages after, after he's elected, they would feel even worse, it seems to me. And this, this tendency toward divisiveness would be exacerbated. So I think the divergence is exactly where the strategy resides. Keep everybody on edge and keep everybody divided and irritated as well. The big picture on, on this particular slide again just looking at the left is that the, and the the utility of this slide is really that we broke out the black black representation fundamentally and here this line that goes way down which i would have to admit is based on very few um appeals there's not very many in this in this set goes way negative after the election but pretty consistently they're less positive than were the appeals to the right or to the left without the black constituency being included here too on twitter it's a little easier to see i think the bottom line is the black right trolls and this line is the black left trolls, also more negative. Um, so it seemed to us that there was, there were definitely race targeted handles to get more negative appeals in, th that's what the data show at least. So racial identity seems to have been very deliberately targeted and very deliberately targeted with pretty negative messages. Why? we believe it might have had something to do with building that in-group constituency initially and then feeling less interested in voting closer to the election and then getting angrier after the election to kind of you know tune out the black population we know for a fact that uh, the black voters were diminished in number in the 2016 election compared to Obama's election. So this is sort of what we're, what we're finding in, and the way we're explaining those patterns. 
we're certainly hashing this out with our reviewers and, and so forth. And the other interesting finding, I think, is that Twitter is used a little differently than Facebook when it comes to emotion. Um, it's used, it's much more extreme and it's much more negative. And I think that has everything to do with that platform, who uses it and how people use it as well. And the methods of engagement are all there. So it's already after eight. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if this is a time, Kevin, to, if, if there are more questions, we could talk about those because I'm about to leave that data uh, at, at this point, I don't know if anybody the, wanted. The big question we had was somebody had asked, um, you know, your theories about why so many of the ads were positive, but then you got into it more. Yeah. Um, um, I guess I'll just say, yeah, you know, uh, does anybody have any questions about what has been discussed that you'd uh, like to ask uh, Dr. Sturber mm -hmm. before we move on? Uh, uh, we, we have a <laughs> well, wait, well, somebody just raised their hand. So I, there's one question. Go ahead. <laughs> Can I speak with you after this presentation, Dr. Sure. Strover, because um, this is opening up so many questions. I don't want to take time right now. Okay. Be happy to. And uh, we've, we've published one article on the, on the first set of findings on Facebook and emotion. And this, these comparisons with Twitter are, before a journal, we've had some really great commentary from reviewers. And in, in fact, I was thinking when, when um, the question came up earlier about anti-DEI, one of our reviewers criticized how we broke out and coded our Twitter responses. And, and the suggestion was to expand uh, the, the sets of terms that we used to try to pick up black representation and that turned out to be really a, a good development for our findings when we cast a wider net it didn't really change our findings but it it made them stronger um dr sir there's a question um you said some of this is published somewhere if yeah, so is yeah. that a place people can see uh, sure yeah we have a journal article on the international journal of communication and um, I can, you know, again, I, I have full screen open. I don't have the chat open. So. <laughs> well, also, um, well, also, Dr. Sturver, if it's okay with you, I can uh, share your email in the chat for people to contact you after if sure. you're okay with I that. J yeah, the International Journal of Communication in May, I think it was, we had an article. All right, well, um, I will share your yeah. email so that those interested can email you and ask their questions. Sure. Sure. So beyond that, more generally, I, th I think, you know, talking about using the internet and social media and how they get into their accounts, I suspect that for, for EFF, a lot of these techniques are pretty well known, operating fake accounts, using bots and botnets, of course, and, and the ways that we can detect that. Uh, can be laborious, but they're eminently possible. And some of these groups that I mentioned before that operate around the world are really very keenly tracking bot and, and bot activity. Bots, of course, amplify results. And they amplify results in all kinds of domains, not just political domains. And then, of course, there are just, just plain old trolls. A lot of people ask me, well, how can you find how can you know if what you're looking at is mis or disinformation? And there are several clues. And again, I suspect many of you are very familiar with the need to kind of carefully check domain names. And the, the Russians' use of spelling errors and poor grammar were one tip off back in back four years ago. It has been an interesting development that they have heard our, um, that, that that that's a giveaway now and in the more recent years they have based, they have hired native speakers and set up fake domains in based in the united states and, and really operated in a faux fashion by what appeared to be americans or 
English, native English speakers, so that they've eliminated this whole giveaway on spelling errors and poor grammar and so forth. And a few of those have been in the news lately when writers realized they were writing for the Russians instead of for, for some, some blog, some blogging site that they thought would supplement their income in, in some way, shape or form. One thing that we observed over time since we looked at how ads appeared in 2015 and and up to the present day is that the content has kind of changed and the these disinformation um, efforts got a little bit more sophisticated about the look and the feel of fakery and much more meme based content later on compared to kind of old fashioned looking banner ads early on and that's you know maybe it's not a giveaway but it is a clue i think to their abilities to constantly reinvent and to try to stay up to date there are a lot of well-known fact checking sites that people who that we can refer people to um Dr. Sarachi, a, a question that was asked in the chat very much about the fat checking sites raises the point, you know, that one, uh, one problem, though, with a lot of those fat checking sites is that the disinfo people have spread the meme that these sites are run by the far left and are propaganda and unreliable. So some people will actually disbelieve you more if you point them to these fact check sites. Which is a, which is definitely a problem. I, I, um, I have another reason why I think fact check sites are important. They're prop they may be more important for the careful news consumer, the person who bothers to wonder about this. My my take on a lot of news, and I'm coming from a department, a school of journalism and media, is that a lot of people don't really carefully read what they see on social media sites anyway. And the number of people, the volume of people who are actually going to go, go to the trouble to fact check will be pretty small. And they probably would not be the people who would consistently contribute to the problem of circulating mis and disinformation to begin with. Um, so my whole take on that is, is a little bit different. And, and I'm glad the fact checkers are there. We need, we need a backup. But I think we need something more than more than that. Um, uh, we we ultimately need to think about working with the platforms if that's possible. And I would readily confess to kind of jaundiced view on the ability to work with platforms uh, simply because some of things that they probably should do and have to do go against the grain uh, of their economic market. And to the extent that circulation is their bread and butter economically, it becomes a difficult sell for Facebook to do the sorts of things that one might want them to do. Um, and that's that. I, I think to for a group like EFF, do you really want to check? Do you really want to entrust the platforms to do the right thing? Do we want to entrust the government? <laughs> to do the right thing. There are problems with both those scenarios. And so, we, we're intimately interested in both those problems because, you know, actually, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people on the left who really do have these big calls for this. The platforms need to police their information ecosystems more. But, you know, uh, one thing that, you know, uh, Cory Doctorow has pointed out a lot about the people who call for this is, well, a lot of the anecdotal evidence is that when platforms actually do these crackdowns on what can and can't be said, oftentimes it's actually far left views that get shut down speaking more. Like, you know, oftentimes uh, activists for racial justice will be silenced or, you know, yeah. activists against sexual violence will be silenced. It's like, you know, you, you, when you ask the platforms to censor, you don't get to choose who they will censor. Yeah. And, they're, and they're not elected or accountable to anyone. In fact, I, I was looking, I used in my class this, uh, this semester, a, a section from this book on, it's really about content. Was it from this book or from this other book? It was from Tarleton Gillespie, <laughs> in which he gets into uh, platform content moderation. 
and he kind of takes apart the way in in which YouTube was policing the mention of the word or the use of the word breast and 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 the lactation advocates were basically censored and you know that didn't do breastfeeding everything about breastfeeding was gone um that might have been facebook actually now that i'm thinking i can't remember but that's that's but a perfect of, example of the unintended yeah. consequences of saying let's censor all the disinformation and it's like well a lot of valuable yet unpopular information will get censored right. Yeah, it's it's a dilemma. So what you know is there is there a one single solution? I I'm guessing there isn't one single solution. But uh, at the end of this, and I think I'm almost to the end here. I was just going to mention Bot Sentinel, which is a bot check bot checking site, and sort of looking at images to try to be very a little bit more careful about deep fakes and some of my undergraduates have much better eyes for this than I do. This is a, a pretty obviously photoshopped photo of, of a lead female producer who was, you know, who was behind some of the Star Wars stuff and she was giving a talk and somebody photoshopped the, the t-shirts here and kind of was trying to trash what she was doing and what this school for girls was doing. I thought it was sort of interesting to compare what Twitter was going to use for checking tweets. This is what they were originally going to use, these big orange banners, and they ended up with, with you know, using ban banners that were a little less, that were a little more subtle from, from where I sit, <laughs> at least. Um, and what to do, and this, this is the wrap up really is, um, I think we need better training for people um, and not just people in school, not just kids in K through 12, not just college students. I think we need training, especially for older people in all candor. And this brings me back to where we started with our older audience at the library here who were very concerned, but didn't know what a meme was. Um, I think there's a lot of room to help pe help train people fundamentally to uh, to recognize, to care, to um, and to see what it is that they're that they're working with, and and to figure out a way that they can be a little bit more proactive about the information that they're that they might be sharing. So I'm assuming my screen sharing is off now. Yes, yeah, somebody just wrote back to critical thinking. That, that is exactly what it is. But you know, maybe, maybe the case has to be made that older people get into patterns of not being as critical as we all might be and we all should be. Uh, the Pointer Institute is actually doing some training right now in conjunction with AARP. To, to try to develop the, the tools and the modes for training older people specifically. And there's a lot, there are a lot of training efforts uh, afoot right now targeting younger people who are still captive because they're in schools and you can still reach them. <laughs> You, you know, Dr. Sir, I find myself wondering, you know, uh, you know, you uh, a few times uh, to uh, the flatter of everybody in this room, you know, said that we're probably a little more critical crowd. It's probably a little harder to trick us with some of these techniques. I'm wondering if you've done any research on if people like the IRA have specific tactics they use on savvy people like us that we're actually more likely to fall for precisely because we think we're not rubes who would fall for stuff like this. I like that idea. <laughs> that would be really interesting. I have not looked at that. Well, may, may, um, maybe pull it out in your next graph a uh, sentiment. I'm just curious because I like to, I don't like to get too cocky. I don't be to, like to, you know, anytime I'm like, oh, well, I would never fall for saying that dumb. I'm like, I probably have and don't even realize it. You know, somebody has tricked probably everybody in this room at least once with some of this stuff. But, you know, it, it you know, it, it's careful not to get too complacent that you couldn't yeah. be tricked by these sort of things, especially with, highly convincing deep fakes becoming increasingly ubiquitous. Well, and, and I think to, to the extent that phishing and scamming has become very commonplace 
in so many of our online transactions, a lot of people have their guard up. And, that, and what that means is trust no one, but there are some real downsides to trusting no one as well. So ultimately we have to trust somebody, it seems to me. Um, otherwise that, you know, that does feed into the dissolution of our society. Um, and I think uh, I, a question that I don't know if it was meant to be asked uh, publicly or not, but I think it's fine to go ahead and share it. Um, one question I asked is, um, you mainly focus on the IRA, but um, yeah. are, I, you know, we, and I know the answer is yes, yeah. but there are other countries who have similar coordinated uh, yes. campaigns. Um, and, you know, to be equal, I mean, I think Iran's a fairly famous one, North Korea too, yeah. though to be equal opportunity, the U.S. has these operations as well. Definitely, definitely. Some of, you know, there's a lot of research going on around COVID right now. And uh, a new research project is looking at COVID misinformation in several countries, like Brazil is one and, and Italy as well. And, you know, I also collaborated with a research group that had some amazing data from China. And we looked at some of the circulation of misinformation around COVID in China, which was so very interesting as well. They have a totally different media system, obviously. State yeah, yeah, media. yeah, actually, that, I, that, that makes me suddenly realize I was thinking to myself, that's like a very interesting question. What even does the fact that their internet is so tightly controlled by the state, what even does a disinformation campaign on the Chinese internet look like, actually? Well, that it, it was interesting to me, and I was I had a very minor role in this study, but I was agog when I saw some of the some of the results. There is regular circulation about stuff like Chinese folk remedies. That's misinformation. There were when word got out about that linchpin Chinese doctor who sounded the alarm early and then got his wrist slapped by the government. He became a very important icon in Chinese society. Everybody knew what he had done and how he had suffered for coming out early. The government clamped down on him. He ultimately died, of course, of COVID himself. And, uh, you know, that became part of the folklore in China. Uh, people knew about it. So not everything can be hidden, well, even in in well, well in, in, indeed. Uh, I mean, um, you know, mo most people in China and communities like ours know what a VPN is. <laughs> profiteering was another theme. And, and indeed, you know, we saw some profiteering in our country when there were runs on supplies in the first days of COVID here, you know, running out of toilet paper and stuff like that. There was profiteering. There was there was there were runs on uh, with the runs on gasoline for a little while. I can't remember, but that profiteering there was a cycle of that in Chinese society too. So um, not for me to hog all the questions. I think you know as we received the other service talk. Uh, are there questions that have not been covered yet, uh, or any especially people who have not asked a question or not spoken yet? Anybody? Uh, like to ask a question about uh, all the interesting stuff we've just learned. Now I can have the chat open so I can see some of these things. Yeah. I think I've covered most of what was asked for you, though I maybe have missed one or two of them. Yeah, and I probably can think up a few more if people are feeling shy, though. At, we're at the point in the talk where feel free to chime in at any time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, what would... Um, so our, our next research is actually looking at that older population. And I, I have a little bit of funding to do a survey. I'm just sort of putting it together right now. This is not a great time to do a survey, frankly. <laughs> it was because nobody trusts anything anymore. And if I do an online survey in particular, it's really hard to, uh, to get responses. So researchers are having a harder time right now. Um, I guess my question for you, you know, you talk about, and I really appreciate you acknowledging that uh, the answer is that there aren't easy answers or technology solutions, because I feel one of the big things we have to do at EFF is people always want to think 
tech can magically solve human problems when it really can't most of the time. But I guess, I, so, you know, I agree with you. I don't think there's an easy solution to online disinformation and, you know, asking the platforms or the government to solve it creates as many problems as it solves. Yeah. I'm curious if you have thoughts on things that are definitely not the solution because one thing at, at EFF we're very good at is we maybe don't know how to solve a problem but we're usually pretty good at saying well that definitely won't work and is a terrible idea do, do you have you seen proposals to the problem that based on your research you're just like that is a terrible idea that won't work and and politicians or people in charge need to quit proposing this I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of Facebook convening its own set of regulators uh, I don't know that that's going to really be something that we trust and something that, in fact, will carry any real weight with the platform itself. Um, you know, a lot of other countries have, have a different legal system. They do not have a First Amendment, which, you know, we, we know and love. But boy, you can see all the, pro you can see all the warts with it right now. Well, you know, on the one hand, hooray, we can say anything and no one can stop us, but oh, we can say anything and no one can stop us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't have, I don't have the silver bullet. I, 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 I'm, I'm I not think, asking you to, I don't. <laughs> I think, you know, broad, broad awareness, access to training materials, you know, picking, making, making sure that there are some prominent examples of, of poor communication and, and nefarious communication, disinformation, that people are, read, are, are aware, so that people become aware of it quickly. I think that would be good. But you mentioned that one, one of your members did a little, did, did a talk on QAnon. I mean, that is just very, both perplexing and, and um, demoralizing. Well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it plays into many, as somebody who's always been fascinated by conspiracy theories, it plays into many threads that have been around for many years, but uh, what it has uh, turned itself into is uh, something. <laughs> yeah. The only saving grace, I think, is, is remembering that we've been through dark times with bad information before and and came through you know, oh I, yes i, I the McCarthy I, era right. horrible um nazism terrible you, you know the 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 weight of those propaganda movements is you know has really soiled history but we have moved out of them we've moved past them well, and, and to that, I mean, this actually came up, I think, even in our last meetup where uh, where we had our uh, board member and co-founder, John Lukowski, talking, you know, just about uh, kind of the history of his view of the internet at large and history of it. But, but you know, the, these problems came up again then, you know, and I always love to tell people who really are despairing over the disinformation fake news that, you know, frankly, the craziest fake news that I've ever come across in history was that straight up for 500 years, most people in England believed a completely fake version of their own history where the wizard Merlin was real, for God's sake. Like, literally for 500 years, they believed all these made-up kings, like, like King Lear, Shakespeare's King Lear. He's one of these made-up kings they thought was real. And everyone in the country believed it for literally 500 years until one day some scholars in the 1500s said, wait a minute, there's no evidence any of these people ever existed. But nobody thought to question it for 500 years and one book in the 10 hundreds just made it all up. And you know, it got sorted out eventually, though it took 500 years. <laughs> so I certainly, I don't think it's the worst. It's just fake news has been around a long time. Yeah. And actually, I do have one final question I would like to ask you. Um, uh, actually, all right, there is another question for you in the chat that I will ask you. But first, I wanted to ask you, have you, your research at all started to look into, have you seen an increasing rise in the use of things like deep fakes in these disinformation campaigns? And does that alarm slash concern you? My friend Michael Garfield even calls this what he calls the end of reality, where basically we think people 
can't believe anything right now, people are going to shut down and believe nothing when the audio and video could all be completely yeah. fake. I, I do find deep fakes even more problematic, and it has to do with that bias I referred to earlier about seeing is believing. Um, I, I think it kind of plays to that almost human instinct. The psychologist would probably have, have a lot of better explanations for it, but his, historically the dominance of sight in particular as, as a sense is part of that. So deep fakes are, are very problematic and it kind of syncs up as well with, with the question about, have I looked at Instagram or TikTok? And okay, I, you, 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 at, you saw that, good. That was I, an I see okay. it now, I have it open. Um, and it kind of gets back to our realization as we, doing, as we were doing this work about the inability to effectively um, decipher and characterize use of images. Images are, you, you know, we have great natural language processing mechanics to parse text. We've got that. Uh, we don't have that for images. And maybe we'll get, we, the royal we, we'll get there eventually. But right now, you know, and as much as Instagram and TikTok are all about images, and that's where all this emotional impact, I think, can really convey idea, you know, notions, feelings very quickly. And it's again, those feelings that social media amplify and are so very good at facilitating our inclination to share and to, to take it into our groups, to take it into our lives in some way. So I think those are, um, I think images, the mimetic uh, is, is extremely important and it's probably what we should be paying a lot of attention well, to. And, right now. and, you know, coming at it from an EFF -E sort of slant, you know, you mentioned how, you know, you'd seen a rise of, uh, you know, memes spreading this stuff and, and image collages. And really, I, I think that ties a lot into what you said about we have a lot of NLP mm -hmm. algorithms. Uh, it's basically to get around the algorithms to censor or detect content in text. It, the algorithms can't find it in these memes yet. So you can spread yeah. propaganda in the network and not get detected by the propaganda algorithm as easily. Yeah, yeah. Good. That's why I'm so excited by what Good Systems is doing at UT, you know, trying to, to, to look very carefully at what's going on with artificial intelligence and trying to harness making it good, you know, defining that is another, is another, another challenge, of course, but UT just, just designed with some National Science Foundation funding a new institute of artificial intelligence and we'll be working with them. So maybe we'll be making some headway in this space. And I noticed that our participant Sam has his hand up. Sam, did you have a question you wanted to ask Dr. Strover? Yeah, I have a question in terms of, um, you know, I mean, the whole notion of uh, objectivity. Uh, you know, there have been all these, you know, debates about, you know, that's like a noble ideal, quote unquote. But, uh, you know, I mean, oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, there have been periods of time where countries have not had so called objective uh, press and they've done fine. And, uh, even the, you know, obsession with fact-checking, I remember Susie Hansen, who is a New York Times correspondent, uh, or she writes for several publications, but sometimes her work has appeared in New York Times from Turkey. And she has very incisive analysis. She's written a book on Turkey. She has all these contacts on the ground there, different, you know, ethnicities and, you know, I mean, different uh, political strands, but not. And I remember her saying that, uh, you know, her stories were just, sort of dying on the vine because there was so much fact checking quote unquote going on. Yeah. And you know, I mean, again, her sources oftentimes, they could not, you know, expose themselves or, you know, many of these things were not necessarily in black and white. So just curious, you know, <laughs> kind of a meandering question, but yeah, what are your thoughts on uh, both objectivity and, you know, fact checking? Thanks. Um, boy. Well, I, th I think, Journalism requires fact-checking if they're going to maintain 
the the status of being a a reliable source. So I think I think some fact fact checking is essential. I think in journalism, is it overdone for some for some people? I. I don't, I honestly don't know. I do look abroad where journalism is avowedly partisan. You know, there's no problem in Britain knowing which is the conservative press and which is the liberal press. And, and you know, it's right there on the front page. People know what they're getting when they get uh, certain sorts of publications. Uh, is that a way for us to go? I mean, in a way we're, we're kind of there already when we have cap certain cable news programs that are pretty out there as progressive or pretty out there as conservative. So um, that doesn't mean that the status of the fact, however, needs to be jeopardized. It's the interpretations associated with what the fact means, perhaps that is, that becomes jeopardized. And, you know, that's interesting. Is once again, that ties into actually another conversation I was having with our board member, John, about this topic. You, you see, we care about these topics a lot, but, you know, he's he's been a journalist for a lot of his career and has written for various publications like Boing Boing and Wired and, and stuff like that. And, you know, so he cares very much about the old school journalistic idea of like, you know, uh, fact-based, uh, evidence-based reporting and whatnot. And, you know, I remember I like was getting a conversation with him about like, you know, because he was like asking, where can I find actual news online these days? You know, not bias, not opinion, not propaganda news. And and I sort of asked him the following question, you know, and, and frankly, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, too. But I was just like, well, that's isn't that the million dollar question? And which of the following three headlines about this historical event would you consider news, John? Because frankly, I would consider them all news in the sense that they all are providing me some useful information, but also none of them's the entire story. Uh, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Uh, Japanese kill hundreds of innocent Americans in surprise sneak attack or tired of years of American imperialism, Japanese assert right to self-determination and take out American military base. Which one of those is news slash accurate and, or are they all or none of them, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a good, it's a good example. Yeah. And once again, I don't know if there's an easy answer. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think there is an easy answer. I think though that there is, an easy um, analysis of what's at stake. And yeah. I do not think that you get, forgive me, to kill 7 million people without some severe propaganda before the event. And so in the grand scheme of things, I don't think you get some of the atrocities associated with reconstruction without some propaganda before the event. So could you maybe talk about, you know, the long arc of history and what we need to look out for with respect to deep fakes and um, partisan journalism? <laughs> Boy, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a big, and and, and a, a, a well taken one, yes. <laughs> How about that? That is the subject of the next EFF talk. <laughs> the long arc of history, man. I, well, I'm, I mean, I I mean you could make the meta but very true point that all history is propaganda, you know, and depends on whose version's currently being told. Well, and the one that you hear is told from the point of view of the winners. You, in most yeah. cases, yes, though sometimes later on, later historians correct it, though usually it's corrected because it's acceptable to correct it with whoever is currently in charge at that time. Yeah, you know, Yuval Harari has some very interesting observations. On, I mean, that's the person for the long arc of history, I think. Um, I would commend commend that author for for you know really big picture thinking about about the role kind of the role of information and information technologies in how we construct our version of history yeah, a lot of great questions um 
Well, we're starting to get close to time here, and I don't believe we have to run right up to nine. We usually end a bit before. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for the comment about my uh, cat, Summer. Yes, she is making her presence through my filter known here. Um, but um, does anybody have any final questions for Dr. Strover before we wrap it up? No? All right, well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Strover. I want to thank Sharon so much for joining us. Um, really You're delightful, informative talk. Um, if I could make a couple of pitches, there, oh, you know, this, this Good Systems effort has created some uh, focus groups. They're called research focus groups. One of them is focused on public interest. Another is focused on racial bias, all kind of looking at it from the AI perspective. So I'll give Kevin some links to those groups and we would love to have more people, we'd love to reach beyond the university to have people who are interested in talking, thinking, doing in some of those. Some by of those all, by all means, uh, please do share those with me and yeah. um, I'll disseminate them to the community. And um, by yeah. all means, uh, any of your uh, research partners or your community who would like to, you know, come talk, share their research on any uh, EFF relevant stuff, we'd love to have them at any time. Yeah. Um, as I said, I'm still looking for speakers next year, so uh, certainly interested in people. Um, and, and yeah, any, as, as I s did earlier, I posted uh, Dr. Strover's email in the chat. So if you want to contact Dr. Strover with questions about the talk or about her research, um, you know, do within reason. Don't make me regret giving you her email. <laughs> but, um, but, um, I, but I want to thank Dr. Oh, Strover. I have a oh, one, all right, we have one final question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, in terms of shout outs, as I think about it, I, I attended a, a seminar by the American Psychological Association mm -hmm. on um, bias in AI, mm -hmm. and maybe the EFF would like to follow up with some of those researchers. I mean, absolutely. Um, right in our wheelhouse, we actually had somebody a talking lot of people about racial algorithmic bias uh, several meetups ago, actually, so it's <laughs> certainly a topic we're following closely. Yeah, gender, race, um, just the development from a statistical technique focused on the average rather than focused on uh, the deviation from the average. Yeah. I found that very interesting work. And yeah. well, you know, well, you know, like and I'll say, Marcia, yeah, you know, you're, you're welcome. Uh, you know, I know you're in our Facebook group. You're, uh, you're welcome to message me anytime. Um, I'd, be, I'd be happy to follow up on anything you think would be interesting. Oh, cool. Thank you. All right. What? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm only hearing a dial up modem. Um, yeah, it's like a throwback. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, Edward. I'm, I'm not hearing you if you want to ask something. <laughs> um, well, as I said, though, anybody who wants to get in touch with me afterward, I'll also, most of you probably know how to get in touch with me, but I will put my email in the chat here real quick for anyone who wants to email me about whatever. I will also just reemphasize that we are having, um, you know, our virtual holiday party fundraiser tomorrow night. We'd really love it if you could come. As I said, uh, $20, but that is suggested. You can throw $5 or even literally $0 at the ticket, depending on what your budget allows. But, um, but we'd love to see you. You know, it'll be, you know, hopefully a fun time um, just for some of us to hang out and, uh, share camaraderie in these difficult times. And even if you're not able to make it, you know, uh, any donation you give goes to a good cause. So we'd appreciate that as well. Um, and, you know, we'll just also be taught, looking forward to the year ahead and uh, trying to figure out where we go from here. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'll just say thanks once again to Dr. Strover. Thank all of you for continuing to come month after month to these. I know these are crazy times and there's so many other places you could choose to be. So it's, it's very flattering that uh, you have chosen to continue to support us and be with us as a community uh, through all this. It's been uh, very gratifying. And uh, we look forward to the day that we can all actually uh, get a beer in person again. But uh, until then, this will have to do. Um, but thank you all for uh, coming. And um, you know, continue to follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Meetup, on our mailing list, on all the things. Um, you know, someday if I quit being lazy, I will try and get us like maybe a proper Discord or something so we're not all hanging out in a Facebook group, but uh, one thing at a time. 
But um, <laughs> thank you all so much for coming. And um, hopefully I'll see some of you tomorrow night. Um, and if not, I'll hopefully see you at the next month's meetup. Okay. Bye. So everyone. long.